In this presentation, we're going to talk about full hairy growth. Is this possible? Is this a pipe dream? We are going to dive into all of the evidence and the anecdotes to find an answer. But first, before we do that, we have a little bit of a side quest because we have all seen the treatment mega responders from finasteride, dutasteride, minoxidil on Reddit's address list. We've got guys like this who have basically regrown three Norwoods of hair just with a small dose of finasteride. Same here, and in just five months, significant crown thickening. And this individual who basically reversed his diffuse thinning in just six months of progress. And these people, they don't just exist online. We also have them inside of our site. We have individuals who have seen outcomes like this from minoxidil plus microneedling, this from scalp massages and dietary changes, this from a full-fledged pharmaceutical approach, and this as well from a stimulation-based interventional approach. And it, it begs this question, is full hair regrowth actually possible? And before we answer that, we have to contextualize the results that we're kind of seeing because we know that anecdotes, they represent what is possible but not necessarily what is probable. So what do I mean by that? Well, what's possible? Let's look at this scatter plot right here. We have a bunch of individual data points. We can see one right here, right here, right here. And effectively, these little data points represent what is possible. They're individual responses on this chart. But this line right here, that represents the average of all of those outcomes. It's what's probable. And sometimes the difference between possible and probable can be huge. And where we see this as most evident is with before and after photos that are circulating the internet from hair growth protocols. So right here, we'll see results of what is actually possible. We see these mega treatment responses. We have them on our site and elsewhere. But this trend line down below is the average response. It is what the real expectation is. And this is the exact reason why we built our compare treatments feature. Because of course, on these scales, you will see people who have mega responses to any possible treatment. But we can always contextualize what we think the average outcome will be. So check out these tools. The x-axis marks the the months of use that you're using a treatment, and the y-axis marks your regrowth potential for that treatment. Anything between a zero and a one is typically averaging microscopic hair gains. You will see it under a microscope. You will not see it or feel it in person. One to two is slight cosmetic hair gains. Two to three is significant cosmetic hair gains. And three to four is the best results you can get beyond FDA approved drugs. And we catalog all of this data with peer reviewed research compared to before and after photos presented in peer reviewed publications alongside actual hair volume changes in terms of hair counts and hair diameter. So you can look at all of our data for how we collect these. And Without this tool, we might reason our way into any regimen using any anecdote online. So now that that side quest is covered, we have to then revisit this question. How do we explain why some people get crazy results from these hair growth drugs and even natural interventions? Um, and, and also, how can we predict if we might be one of these mega responders? Because they, they are so exciting to find. And with that in mind, you know, is full hair regrowth not just a rare possibility, but a probability, and, and how can we best optimize for it? And really, that's what I want to cover in the rest of this presentation. We're going to talk about the main kind of hair loss, androgenic alopecia, and how it advances. We're going to talk about the current consensus of how much hair we can regrow, and then we're going to revise elements of that consensus with further evidence. So let's start. First, Androgenic alopecia is perhaps the world's most common hair loss disorder, at least the one in which men and women seek treatment. It looks like this in women and this in men. You typically have a diffuse patterning with hairline retention in females. You've got the temple recession, diffuse thinning, and then a bald spot forming at the scalp for men. And it's so common that you can't really walk down a city block without spotting somebody with the condition. It's also chronic, progressive, and without treatment, it tends to worsen. And the typical patterning that we see is here. And if you wanted to learn more about these patternings or play around with these models, we have those inside of our hair loss disorders chart. So feel free to check those out. Now, the way that male pattern hair loss and female pattern hair loss or androgenic alopecia progresses is twofold. The first way we cover in detail and ad nauseum on our site, it's through hair follicle miniaturization. 
So effectively, the hair strands themselves get thinner and thinner and thinner over a number of hair cycles until they're so thin and wispy that you can barely see them at all. And the first few rounds of this, you typically still have visible hair. And then as that progresses, it goes from visible to invisible or cosmetic to not cosmetic. And you have terminal producing hairs, which actually add to your volume of hair. And then you have these vellus hairs, which really just don't show you any type of cosmetic uh, hair at all, at least when you're looking at somebody's scalp from a distance. So with that in mind, the way that this progresses is through hair shedding. So if you measured one of these hairs at the tip all the way down to the root, you would effectively see that Throughout most of the hair cycle, the hair diameters, they basically stay exactly the same. So they don't actively miniaturize as they grow. Instead, what happens is the hair sheds out, the old follicle collapses to make way for a new hair cycle. And then when that new hair cycle is reforming for its next growth stage, damage is incurred around the base of the hair follicle. And you go from this size in one cycle to this size in the next, which then locks you into a thinner hair strand. And when that hair sheds, the process repeats and it repeats and it repeats and it repeats until you basically have vellus hairs that are thin, wispy, and not cosmetic at all. Now, that's the first way that male pattern hair loss and female pattern hair loss progress. The second way is through disappeared hair strands. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you examine a healthy scalp with a trichoscope device or a magnifying device, you'll basically see that in the absence of hair loss, there are these hair clusters everywhere. And these hair clusters produce between two to five hair follicles per hair follicle cluster. And when you look at these, you'll think, oh wow, I have great hair density. Well, the first stage of androgenic alopecia is actually what's known as a telogen effluvium shed, where out of nowhere, multiple hairs shed simultaneously, and you end up with two to five hairs per hair follicle cluster, going down to one to three per hair follicle cluster. And when those shedding hairs do come back, they grow back miniaturized. So to recap really quickly, the way that this progresses as men and women is that you have disappeared hairs during hair shedding. So some hairs shed out, some don't come back, and the ones that do start to miniaturize, that's that shedding event that accompanies the initiation of androgenic alopecia. And then the second piece of this is that you have hair follicle miniaturization. And that first piece, those disappeared hairs, are classically defined as kenogen hairs. They're basically hairs that are stuck in between hair cycles. And this has been clinically demonstrated across a number of studies. In fact, some research suggests that in some patient populations, the main driving force of the loss of hair in androgenic alopecia comes from kenogen hairs. So that, when you look at a regular scalp that's affected by androgenic alopecia, will end up showing you something that looks like this. You have a series of thick hairs. You have some hairs that are completely vellus and, and miniaturized completely. You have actively miniaturizing hairs. And then all throughout this scalp, you also have kenogen hairs, hairs that you cannot see because they're trapped in between hair cycles. They've shed out, but that new hair cycle, just for whatever reason, hasn't yet restarted. So with all of that background in mind, what is the current consensus on what can be regrown? Well. Let's dive into it. First, researchers are very certain that we can save these kenogen hairs. Again, those are those hairs that disappear at the early stages of androgenic alopecia and never fully start another hair cycle over again. So they're stuck in between those hair cycles. And they also are pretty sure that we can save partially miniaturized hairs. So hair follicles that have maybe only miniaturized, uh, you know, maybe 10%, 20%, 30%. But what can't we regrow? Well, Researchers also believe that we cannot currently regrow with the best medical therapies available. So we're talking finasteride, dutasteride, minoxidil. We can't regrow things like vellus hairs, hairs that are fully, fully miniaturized and thin and wispy and under 40 micrometers in diameter. And we also cannot save hairs that have detached from the goosebump muscle also known as the erector pili muscle. And so I'll explain that in just a moment. But effectively, what is recoverable versus irrecoverable is these kinds of hairs that are actively in their miniaturization stages, those are recoverable. But anything that has disconnected from its erector pili, even if it's still a terminal hair that is 
sparing pigment or of fully vellus hair, those are predominantly believed to be irrecoverable from medical treatment. And the reason why is because researchers have gone and they've measured vellus hairs before and after heavy medical therapy. So again, finasteride, dutasteride for women, spironolactone, minoxidil. And they'll see that a lot of the hairs that return, those hairs are terminal hairs that improve in uh, their density overall, or they're um, hairs that were not there before and trapped in this kenogen stage. But they don't see a change in the ratio of vellus hairs or the absolute number of vellus hairs. And we've also seen this erector pili muscle piece, whereby if you looked at this underneath the hair, uh, the hair follicles themselves, you have this goosebump muscle that when you get cold or you have like some sort of chill, it gets stimulated. You can see the goosebumps on your arm. And each goosebump muscle wraps around these hair follicle clusters that are supposed to produce between two to five hairs per hair follicle cluster. And that first initiation stage where you shed out, all of a sudden, some of those hairs never reconnect in their new hair cycles with the erector pili. And so those hairs get disconnected from that muscle. And those are the hairs that then succumb to miniaturization that according to some computer modeling and clinical research cannot be reversed. And again, that is what exactly we're showing right here. These are all gripped by some sort of goosebump muscle. It looks like that underneath the surface. And then as you progress in androgenic alopecia, the clinical studies suggest that once that hair follicle detaches from the erector pili, it cannot be saved even with the best of medical therapies. And those are the ones that have been studied. So, with that in mind, when researchers reflect on these hyper responders, the people that we showed earlier in this presentation, the stigma or the stipulation is that these individuals must have just had a ton of kenogen hairs. That's the way that their hair loss advanced. It must have been a bunch of trapped hairs and maybe a few partially miniaturized hairs. And that is why they saw such a big treatment response because they think that those are the only hairs that are recoverable from androgenic alopecia treatments, right? Well, I actually think that's wrong. I would like to offer an opportunity to revise consensus. So in my opinion, there are two major problems with this consensus model of how much hair we can recover with androgenic alopecia. The first is that there is actually a lot of evidence that vellus hairs can turn terminal and that this happens with vellus hairs across the entire body. The examples of this are with werewolf syndrome, when with children have been accidentally megadosed with minoxidil, that growth agonist that some individuals use for hair treatment. And they'll demonstrate vellus hairs that rapidly turn terminal across the rest of their body. And this is very clinically demonstrated. In fact, hypertrichosis, that's the clinical term for it, is demonstrated in upwards of 90% of users of low-dose oral minoxidil. It's one of these things that you see universally, vellus hairs across the body, the face, the chest, the limbs, turning terminal. But it doesn't just happen with body hairs, which have slightly different vellus characteristics from balding vellus hairs. It also happens with AGA-affected hair, uh, vellus hairs as well. This was demonstrated in a study by Norman Orentreich, the original founder of hair transplants and hair transplant studies. This research group, they took fully vellus hairs from somebody's scalp, completely bald. So the full process of miniaturization had already happened. Those hairs were completely disconnected from the erector pili muscle and they transplanted those hairs on the backs of immunodeficient mice. And within a single hair cycle, they reformed an erector pili muscle and they regrew, in some cases, threefold bigger than terminal unaffected by AGA hairs. So that suggests that under the right environment, these hairs absolutely regenerate. I find that absolutely fascinating. And so this idea that once a hair is lost from erector pili detachment, that it cannot be recovered. Studies like this prove to me that under different conditions, under different circumstances, this is absolutely false. So that's the first thing. The second thing 
is that full regrowth from androgenic alopecia has actually happened, but it's happened by accident and under people with no medical therapies for androgenic alopecia. There is a famous case report of a 78-year-old bald man who fell asleep in his armchair at home and slipped backwards and smacked his head on hot coals. Now, he had been bald for decades and he went into the hospital. He received treatment for his burns and he was basically sent home as an outpatient because he refused to stay overnight. And then over the next four to six months, he recovered his entire juvenile hairline completely by accident, because of an accident. And this, to me, suggests that the current consensus of what is recoverable might actually be wrong, because we know that this man definitely didn't just have ketogen hairs. He had fully vellus hairs. Decades of balding will do that to somebody. It's just inarguable that these were all ketogen hairs or partially miniaturized hairs. So what do I think about all this? I think that in the future, wound healing and immunological pathways are probably going to be the key to unlocking full hair regrowth. And not just for these anecdotes and understanding them. I'm talking potentially for everybody. And so the, the future treatments that I am most excited about actually target immunological factors or targets outside of DHT or wound healing pathways. And I think that we're in the infancy of understanding research with microneedling and other wounding modalities. And I would suspect and even hazard a guess that as these therapies evolve and become more sophisticated and prevent against scarring and start to direct new healing pathways that are more causally linked toward hair regrowth and modifying the WNT beta catenin pathways, as research and treatments become more sophisticated toward redirection during wounding phases, I think that full hair regrowth is a possibility for everyone at that point. And that is everything.